I think the question on everyone's lips <laughs> is, you know exactly what's coming. <laughs> Can you boost your immune system? And do we even want to? Oh, that's a great question. Dr. Jenna specializes in understanding how nutrition, movement, and lifestyle interact with our immune system in health and disease. We live in this germy world. It's actually quite normal to get a couple of minor illnesses per year. But what is one of the like most frustrating things you see as an expert on social media when it comes to immunity? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> I could be here all day. Can you really prevent yourself catching these coughs and colds? Hi, I'm Dr. Frankie Jackson. Spence and welcome to Vision of Health, the podcast where I talk to qualified experts about what being healthy really looks like. Through our conversations, we'll bridge the gap between the scientific evidence base and you, the everyday person who just wants to live a healthier lifestyle. I am very much on a mission to provide evidence-based educational content and practical tips that you can actually implement in your everyday lives. Our wonderful sponsors, FemFresh, who have supported me for a number of years now, share the same vision to open up conversations on taboo subjects, to bust the health myths and improve women's health. FemFresh are not only industry leaders in women's intimate hygiene products, but also committed on educating on all things women's health. And this podcast just wouldn't be possible without their support. You can also catch on socials at FemFresh underscore UK and on their website, FemFresh.co.uk. I'm Dr. Frankie, and this is my vision of health. Welcome back to Vision of Health. I'm Dr. Frankie, and today I am so happy to be joined by immunologist, Dr. Jenna Machocki. Dr. Jenna specializes in understanding how nutrition, movement, and lifestyle interact with our immune system in health and disease. And with over 20 years experience, she is on a mission to break down the science behind our health and share the scientifically proven secrets for well-being for good. Based in Brighton, Jenna is a senior lecturer at the University of Sussex. She's a fitness instructor, author of two amazing books on immunity, Immunity, the Science of Staying Well, and Your Blueprint for Strong Immunity. She's also a mother of twins and is a keen home cook creating recipes and rituals inspired by her farm-to-table Scottish roots and capturing her family's Italian heritage. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Jenna. How are you today? I'm very good. It's lovely to see you and great to be here. No, we are so happy to have you on. Thanks so much for coming on. Talk to me about how you got to where you are now. Why immunology? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I probably didn't have a lot of decent career guidance, uh, but I always had this fascination with the human body and health and disease. And I remember as a child, really trying to um, answer these big questions about why did people get sick? What causes us to get sick and what keeps us well? And I remember learning about immunology when I was exploring what to do after I finished school. Um, and in the medical school in Glasgow University, they have a really um, unique immunology department. It's one of the few places where they just have this pure immunology program. And it, it was just amazing. I had the most wonderful mentors. I just got this, I don't know, like insatiable appetite to understand this wondrous system in our body. And that was it. That was really kind of the journey started there. And I've been lucky enough to work in all different areas. I think one of the amazing things about the immune system is that it's important for so many different aspects of our health. So I went on to work in things like allergy and asthma. Then I went on to work in things like nutrition and gut health and the gut microbiome. And so I could sort of follow my own interests and still stay within this amazing field. Yeah. And what I love about it as well is you kind of get both aspects. You get the prevention of disease yes. as well as the treating of existing disease. Exactly. I'm a cancer doctor, so I treat, you know, people who are way down the line and mm -hmm. they've developed a disease. Um, but I think it's so interesting to talk more. And I know lots of our listeners will be really interested to know what they can do to support their health to prevent that disease occurring. And it's nice yeah. that your career has both ends of that spectrum. Exactly. There is kind of two ways of looking at the immune system in that the way that it is a defense system that protects us from things that might harm us. So that could be germs in our environment, infections that we might breathe in or something that could contaminate our food. But there's also the aspect of the immune system that is more um, protecting us from the inside. So cancer, as you mentioned, our immune system is one of the main cancer defense systems in our body. So we've got this kind of what's on the outside that we want to 
protect ourselves from. But then on the inside, we also have this other side of our immune system that's doing a lot to, you know, healing and repairing our body. Even if you don't have an infection, but you break a bone, it's your immune system that's rebuilding that, that bone and tissue around mm -hmm. it. And um, pregnancy, our immune system is really important. So the relationship between the developing baby and the mother and um, keeping that, that baby safe, that's all sort of guarded by these amazing cells of your immune system. Yeah, I think that's um, really interesting. I think the question on everyone's lips <laughs> is, you know exactly what's coming. <laughs> Can you boost your immune system? And do we even want to? Oh, that's a great question. It's one I've really pondered a lot over the years. And I think that when people say that, I really understand what they mean. You know, we're going into winter and there's lots of these seasonal viruses that start to be more prevalent. We don't want to be coming down with them. We don't want to miss out on Christmas parties. We don't want to get be ill or, you know, have our kids off school, that kind of thing. And so we want to boost in the sense of we want to make sure we're as resilient as possible. But when we look at the actual science of the immune system and how it works, boosting probably isn't the best word. It's more like you want a balanced immune system. You want it to be able to work hard when it's needed, but also you want it to turn off when it's not needed because you know, imagine you get a cold and you start to get all those uncomfortable symptoms, you know, the snotty nose, a bit of fever, you feel really run down. That's because your immune system's mounting this inflammatory response. Now that's getting rid of the, the virus causing the illness, but it's also making you feel really unwell. And it could also damage a little bit of your own delicate tissues. There's lots of inflammation in your airways and you start to feel that in, in how you're breathing and, and the other symptoms you have. If that goes on for a long time, you would eventually incur some damage. So you need that inflammatory response to be short term, turn on, do its job, and then turn off and resolve and heal and repair and get you back to normal. So it's always about this balance. So I understand what people mean, but we, we need to think of a better word. Yeah, optimize maybe. <laughs> yes, yeah. And why do you think that people want to boost their immune system? Do you think it's because we're really scared of disease or do you think people just want a quick fix? You know, yeah. they want to be able to pop a pill and not and protect themselves from the yeah, winter. Do you know cold. what? I think I think it, it's a lot of things. Like life is quite busy, you know, in the modern world and being sick, it's quite, it almost feels quite stressful sometimes. I know if I get sick, take time off work, I'm like, oh no, then I have to catch up. Or if my kids are off sick from school, then it's really stressful to try and make all those childcare arrangements if, I, if I'm working. And so we kind of want to get through winter and get through, you know, the seasons with as, you know, as little interference from germs as possible. But what we have to remember is we live in this germy world. We've evolved with germs. It's actually quite normal normal to get a couple of minor illnesses per year. So I think it's something like up to six for an adult and for children more like 12. So it's more like um, we need to account for the recovery time that it takes because ultimately your immune system is amazing, but it needs time to do its job. And so when you get sick, we're always like, and I use the example of my husband because he's the worst. He will run to the pharmacy and he'd be like, give me all the things that make me feel well. And so I can go to work and continue doing everything I need. But, you know, it might make the symptoms lessen. You know, you take some over the counter medicines, it makes you feel a bit better. But ultimately, it's not actually doing anything to remove the infection. Mm. And sometimes it might prolong the duration of the cold. And you've got to think, do you want to be giving that to all your colleagues, you know, mm. commuting into work, going into the office, coughing? Nobody wants your germs. And yeah. so I'm a real advocate for like, we have to start to establish a culture where if someone's sick, they stay home and rest until they feel better. I think COVID was actually quite good for that because yeah. I was someone who was really guilty of judging how ill I was based on how much of my normal life I could do. Yes. So I might yeah. be like, oh, I've got a bit of a runny nose, but I feel okay, yeah. so I can still go to the gym. Yeah. Whereas in COVID, everyone would be like, <laughs> you've got a runny nose or you've got a cough stay exactly. away from me and it made you stay at home. It made you, yeah. And, and I think the kind of attitude has changed now, whereas yeah. I would feel a little bit self-conscious going into the office, coughing and sneezing or on yeah. the tube. Um, whereas previously, I probably would have tried to power yeah. on and get on through my oh, 100%. normal. Oh, 100%. Like, I think we're all guilty of that. I can certainly think of times where I'd be like, no, no, I'm fine because I want to do the normal things. I want to mm. enjoy my job. I want to go to the gym. I've got that night out with friends. You know, we want to do those things. And I think that's something that's come as, you know, with, with 
the, the decades. I don't think that was perhaps something that our grandparents would have done. Mm. And I think it's time to maybe pause and reflect and make space to be well. I always say like one day on the sofa, is perhaps better than continuing on for several days and then f feeling really, really unwell or just not shaking that cold and not having that full recovery. And, you know, there's lots of conversations about long COVID, mm. but there's a really recent study that's came out saying that there's also a long cold, lots of acute illnesses like seasonal colds and flus. Um, the, the study compared COVID with other Upper respiratory, upper respiratory tract infections and found that there was also evidence of these sort of long tail symptoms in people who have um, other types of colds as well as COVID. And although there's many different mechanisms that are causing that, I think that what we call convalescence, which is really allowing yourself to get well after the acute infection. So after those extreme symptoms in the first two or three days, I think that's been lost from our vocabulary. Like I'm quite fascinated by this idea of convalescence. Mm. And years ago, there used to be hospitals where people could convalesce. So if they'd been really sick with the flu, they had a few weeks where they you know, we're supported and getting well again. I think it's lovely. It might not work in the modern world, but I'm going to really interested in how these old fashioned ideas might somehow be able to be brought in in a very modern way. And that might be one way that, you know, we can cope with these modern illnesses. Yeah, I love that. It kind of all feeds into that, like, self-love and yeah. being kind to yourself narrative. Exactly. I think I'm definitely guilty of... Um, of that, you know, mm -hmm. I really wanted to be over as quick as possible. Yeah. I'm just like your husband, even though I'm so <laughs> evidence-based, I mm -hmm. still think like, what's the harm in taking, yeah. you know, some vitamin C, extra vitamin C or something to try and get it rid of it quicker. But actually you're right. If you reframe it and think, if one day of rest is probably going to yeah. shorten this and save me a day at the end, that's yeah. a quite a nice way to think about it. Exactly, yeah. So we mentioned about how, you know, we can't necessarily boost our immune system. Mm -hmm. But what what I'd love to know is, can you really prevent yourself catching these coughs and colds? Because I was quite shocked when you said that six over a year is um, yeah. quite normal for an adult. That yeah. to me sounds like quite a lot. Yeah. Um, I probably get cross when I get maybe three or four <laughs> a, a year. Yeah. Um, and I've certainly noticed that they hit harder now after the pandemic than before. Yeah. Um, so can we do anything in our day-to-day -day life that is going to reduce our chances of picking something up? Yeah, I think there's two parts that we have to look at this. And one part is what everyone forgets. We always think it's, it's our own failing that we've caught this cold. Our immune system isn't good enough or, you know, we haven't given it enough supplements, or whatever. But there's the exposure part, you know, perhaps if we think about lockdown when people were not going out and about and mixing with people a lot of people found they were actually not experiencing the usual winter illnesses that mm -hmm. kind of thing and that's because you just weren't exposed you know these infections need to be able to jump from person to person different infections do that in different ways and so if you live in a city you're commuting every day you work in a busy environment where there's lots of people and then you maybe go socializing you go to the gym your exposure to germs throughout the course of that day is mm -hmm. huge there's loads of opportunities mm -hmm. that you will breathe in something and that might just be enough of a dose to get you unwell and so that's something we always have to think about it's not just about how good our immune system is it's about how exposed you are to germs and then the other half is what's your immune system doing so there's definitely a genetic aspect to this and um you know that's something that isn't very easy to measure it's a very kind of complicated system the way our genes are helping us or helping our immune cells to detect different um, infections but then we layer on top of that the majority is probably down to things in our diet and lifestyle. Uh, and that's really broad. So it's not just about the foods you eat, but it's about all these other aspects. And I kind of think about it as, in one of my books, I called it the sort of immunobiography. So if you track the course of a person's life, uh, and that can sometimes give you a good idea of where they stand at that moment in terms of their immune health, because you are the kind of product of everything that's gone on before. And going right back to childhood, um, and, you know, we still have um, a lot of work to understand this, but there's lots of emerging studies on things that you do in early life, particularly the interaction with the microbiome, so the collection of microbes 
in your digestive tract that you sort of acquire post-birth, these are really training and educating your immune system and they can sort of set up your trajectory for health. So we know that that's a really important milestone. Um, and then whatever you've been exposed to. So a lot of people might have had chicken pox as a child. It's really common um, that kids get it sort of under the age of four or five. And you probably never experience chickenpox again um, because you've had it once. And that one exposure of this virus is giving your immune system a chance to make a memory response. So it's making a memory of exactly what that chickenpox virus looks like and creating these antibodies and cells that will stay in your body. We've got studies that show that the, these immune memory cells can stay up until like 90 years from when you were first exposed. So that's protecting you for the rest of your life. So then you go to someone's house and their child's got chicken pox and you know that you've got, that virus can't even get past because you've already got that memory there. It doesn't work so well for colds and flus. There's a I was few just reasons about to for that. that. <laughs> well, to start with, there's probably about 200 different rhinoviruses, which is one of the viruses that cause the common cold. So that's a lot of different viruses your body would have to make the uh, memory response to and then those viruses like to mutate and change their patterns a little bit so your immune system's always having to catch up so you know you catch the cold um, you make the memory response and then that puts a sort of selective pressure on the virus to try and evolve to change a little bit so that you can catch it again so it's a little bit more tricky and the memory aspect of the immune system is probably something that COVID maybe made the whole um, community of immunology to really think about how much do we really know about what makes a good memory response? And the answer is not very much. We do know that some viruses that infect the blood, so you're getting that sort of whole body exposure, tend to make really good memory responses. So things like chickenpox. The viruses that affect our lungs or our digestive tract, don't tend to make such good um, memory responses. So it's definitely something to do with the location of the infection. But I think this is an area that we're gonna really see a lot more research coming out to understand this. That's super interesting. And I guess that's why people are encouraged to get the flu vaccine each year. So if you've had last year's, it's not effective against this year's strain of flu. Exactly, and, and what they do is they look at what strains are coming from when it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere, because these viruses prefer the cooler climates. So we know that they're sort of moving around the globe depending on where summer and winter is and so they're trying to make a prediction on you know what's happening in Australia and how can that inform what's happening in the UK. Great so we covered the exposure element and then the genetic element mm -hmm. but are there things that we can do in our life to optimize our immune system whether that's what we eat? Yeah. Does what we eat really affect our immune system? Yes that's a really good good place to start because I think food is something tangible we all do it and it's an easy way for people to think this is how I can improve my health like you can change how you eat you can make improvements um when I started researching for my book and I looked at all the books that are out there about the immune system I found it so boring and every one of them was like vitamin c and zinc vitamin c and zinc these two nutrients kept coming up again and again and again and actually for good reason because these are two critical nutrients for the immune system if you are deficient in these you might be more vulnerable to infections um, whether you're deficient or not is a difficult question to answer it really it, those are things you could get from a well-balanced diet and you shouldn't have to supplement. When you get sick, your immune system starts using way more of these two nutrients. So there's a little bit of evidence that if you start taking vitamin C and zinc at the onset of symptoms, you may shorten the duration by like half a day. I mean, it's not a huge amount and it seems to be more effective in people who are under a lot of stress or who like athletes who have a high training load because again probably their needs are, are greater but if we're thinking about you know maintenance of your immune system and I always say it's it's not just for winter it's it's looking after your immune system every day because mm. it's taking care of you every day then the things that I would focus on would be your gut health and that's possibly not something that would come front of mind for people because we do normally jump to those like sort of classic immune boosting vitamins like vitamin C and zinc. But I think 
there's no immune health without gut health because those collection of microbes that live in your gut are so instrumental to educating and training your immune system, not just in the gut, but that's getting passed all around the body. And we have about 70% of those immune cells located along the digestive tract. Um, and then they're taking that information and they're going to the other areas. And there's beautiful studies looking at, you know, things like adding more fiber and prebiotics to the diet and then getting an improvement in the lung health and how well you're protected from respiratory um, infections. So it's what's going on in the gut is also being translated around the body. So that's a really good place to start. And I think in the UK, we are not eating enough fiber. I think that's what the statistics show. Um, and so it can be something that people should start exploring it is that the plants, so the fiber that we want to feed and fertilize these gut bugs is found in plant foods. And it probably isn't a good idea to go from eating very little to eating a lot overnight. You might get a little bit of digestive feedback there, but building up slowly and trying to introduce different plants. And I think it can be quite overwhelming. There's a, a statistic that goes around from the American Gut Project about getting 30 different plants per week. And I was chatting to a friend um, the other day who'd heard this and she was completely overwhelmed, like trying to feed the family and her kids and just thinking, how am I going to now make that jump? And I think that it's do what works for you those tiny little increments like the aggregation of marginal gains which i just think is a real um amazing way to think about it like break it down for you rather than just going right 30 plants this yeah, week <laughs> i love that because one thing i always say to people is if you're doing nothing doing something is better than nothing Definitely. and so if you're eating two different plants a week eating five different plants a week is an improvement on that exactly. and is going to have some benefit. Yeah. It's not that 30 is the cutoff where you, if you don't eat 30 yeah. different plants, <laughs> you know, your gut health isn't going to benefit. Yeah, exactly. If you hit 25, you're still a good way there. Exactly. Um, and I think people really need to hear that. You need yeah. some sort of external validation that you're doing enough. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's just looking for those incremental increases. Yeah. So eating more plants and on the note, you know, your friend who's struggling, I think people forget what counts as a plant. Oh, yes. Like spices, yeah. herbs, all exactly. count as plants. Black um, pepper on your pasta. I've had friends who thought it was just fruit and vegetables, but then it extends to beans and pulses, nuts and seeds. And, yeah. you know, so suddenly you've got way more options. And a lot of those things you might have in your store cupboard, you might have mm. some lentils that you can just put in a bolognese and, you know, playing around with recipes that are, are favorites of, you know, your weekly food prep anyway. So, mm. yeah. And I think in my second book, what I really wanted to do is bring in those kind of behavioral aspects of how we can support our immune system because really we're the product of the habits that we do and I always say you know the immune system's like this wellness system that keeps us well but immunology is only part of the picture the psychology mm. of how we employ that in our day-to-day -day life is huge because it is about establishing those habits like what's something you can sustain every week yeah 30 plants might not be where you're at right now but you can maybe work towards just just changing up the veg that you buy every week because sometimes we get in that habit of you know shopping for the same things before we move on to other lifestyle factors i'd love to just pick up on something you mentioned about eating these plants to feed the microbes mm -hmm. in our gut so that's putting like a positive spin on our immune system. Mm -hmm. We often see microbes as a bad thing and we're yeah. all trying to avoid them. But you're saying that the microbes that live in our gut are good for us. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. And I think it's worthwhile really emphasizing that we... You know, I certainly remember as a child, like germs were bad and you'd see adverts on TV for things that would kill, you know, 99% of all germs. And there was nothing in the conversation about the 99% of good germs that are surrounding us at this very moment, you know, mm. in the air we breathe, every surface we touch, mm. the harmless ones that make up the environmental microbiome and then the ones that make up our gut microbiome. So we have, mm. I think it's something like 38 trillion microbes in their gut that they estimate I don't know how they came out with that figure but it weighs approximately two kilograms so it's a substantial wow. part of your body and they're working hard for us they're like our health allies so you know we have to really start to change the narrative and be like okay we thought that all germs were bad but actually only some of them are and most of them aren't and when it comes to looking after our gut microbes it's not just about the food we eat but there's amazing studies looking at enriching our environment. So spending time in green spaces and the types of microbes 
that we're breathing in that are also then being swallowed and being part of that gut environment that are, you know, we're getting from from just the, the spaces that we spend time in. That's amazing because I definitely notice a benefit when I get some green energy, yeah. I like to call it. <laughs> I get an urge probably about once a month to yeah. just literally get out of London oh, 100%. and absorb some green nature. Yeah, And I always thought that was just mental benefits, but it's interesting um, mm-hmm. that that also could be supporting my gut microbiome and my yeah. immune system. And then in, on that note, there's another aspect to, to nature, which is really fascinating for the immune system. And that's the... Um, the, the the sort of Japanese concept of forest bathing and there's uh, universities in Japan where they did studies on people and they actually looked at empirical data of what their immune cells were doing when they were spending time in urban environments versus in green spaces. Um, and some of the particular immune cells called natural killer cells, which as a cancer doctor, I'm sure you're familiar with because they're one of our cancer protectors, but they're also really good for viral infections. They could see changes in the number and function of these cells and their ability to protect people just from being in the green space. So mm-hmm. they put it, they made the link with um, the, the phyton sides, which are things that are produced by trees. You know, if you're in the forest and you you can smell the forest, yeah. it's like whatever the plants are giving off these um, these uh, volatile uh, compounds. Uh, and just by breathing them in, they're having this beneficial effect on our immune cells. So I think there's it's multifactorial what we get from nature. Like mm. you say, it's good for stress. You're out in the fresh air, you're out in the sunshine. Mm. We're getting that um, environmental microbiome and then we're also getting this sort of uh, effect from the phytocytes of the plants. I remember when I was um, at medical school and I had an immunology lecture and they told me about old practices of when patients used to have tuberculosis Mm -hmm. and they would ship them off to the coast in these hospitals that were on the cliffs with windows and expose them to sunlight and fresh air. Yeah. Um, And I think back then they probably didn't know necessarily the reason why but I read something about the vitamin d um from the sunlight helped boost some of the immune cells yes yeah 100 percent. so that was quite common practice um I lived in Switzerland for a while and they had um uh, lots of places still in the mountains where they would put people and it's this is going back to that concept of convalescence Mm. like putting people in the best possible environment to get themselves fully well. Mm. Um, So, you know, not just the acute infection where you're sick for a few days, but it's the recovery part afterwards. And I think that there's a lot, there's some theories that they thought they were getting the minerals from the sea if they were near the coast, then the vitamin D from the sun, but also the infrared from the sun. So the sun has multiple different wavelengths. We've got the UVA and UVB, but also infrared is about 7% of the sun. And that's what makes you feel warm there's a lot of um, infrared saunas you see start popping out um, and that warming actually penetrates a few centimeters into the body and it's really important at stimulating our cells antioxidant defenses so this is a, a kind of new link that they've now made think of it, that's why people felt so good when we sat them out in the sun and it's really interesting because I know people will fear the sun for good reason because we know that UV radiation is a carcinogen but it just kind of shows you that in nature you can have something that's simultaneously good and bad for you and it's just about finding the sweet spot in terms of the dose yeah wow that's super interesting so one thing that I always used to um experience when I was at school I would work really hard I'd be super nerdy study really hard and every school holiday I would get unwell (laughs) and the same pattern happened at university and now it's the same thing it's like I book a lovely holiday I tell myself I'm having some annual leave and then I get ill (laughs) What is that all about? That is that is a phenomenon that I think a lot of people will um, resonate with. And there's an actual um, term being given to it. It's called leisure sickness. So there was a group of researchers that actually went and tried to study this and figure out why. Um, I wonder if perhaps it was their own personal experience <laughs> that they made, made them do that. But um, it can be quite stressful factoring in that annual leave. I know myself when I have two weeks off work, getting a lot of stuff done. So you're handing over things to your colleagues, putting things in place um, for your absence. Uh, it can be quite busy. On top of that, you know, if I'm packing, I've got to think of the kids. Ha- has somebody's passport ran out and I haven't renewed it? You know, there's a lot of things to... to- <laughs> There's like a lot of things and and that mental load uh, and that adrenaline that you're feeling on mm-hmm. the run up um, 
is going to be causing your immune system a problem. So we might think of it as being quite in our heads, but it's having quite a physical response. So the, a lot of adrenaline, a lot of stress chemistry being produced. And unfortunately, the stress response has been designed so that it's really good in the short term. It gets us to safety. You know, if you're about to be hit by a bus, you need that burst of adrenaline to get you out of its way. Uh, and in that time, your body's saying, don't worry about the head cold. We don't need to deal with that right now. We've got more immediate pressing mm -hmm. things. So if you catch a cold in that period before your holiday, your immune system's kind of been suppressed because of all the stress. And then you get on holiday and you're like, oh my God, I feel so relaxed. This is perfect. Bam. And bam, <laughs> all the symptoms start coming. And the good thing is that hopefully you recover quickly because you're very relaxed and you've got like that time to sit in the sun if you're off somewhere sunny. Oh, I know it too well. <laughs> um, so managing stress is another thing that we can do then to yeah. help support our immune system. I think people are so wanting a quick fix it's so yes. much easier for us to just take our multivitamin and hope for the best but exactly actually some of the practices we've talked about whether that's supporting your gut health um you know getting some fresh air and taking yeah. some time out managing stress they yeah. all actually require a little bit more effort but yeah it is worthwhile people doing that exactly I think it's like little and often and that, as I said those the aggregation of marginal gains is going to add up and there will be days or weeks where you can't do all those good health practices but if you're doing them most of the time, that's what matters. Mm. And that means the weeks or days that you miss, it doesn't have such a big effect. So it's not about being perfect all the time. Mm. But stress is a big one. And I think it's one that's often kind of hiding in plain sight. It's quite hard to tangibly get our head around if we are stressed, is it having an effect? We often think about it as being in our head, but it's a very physical response, there's physical changes in our body that happen when we're stressed. And I think like life can be quite stressful. Mm. Um, and we don't often have ways to mitigate that. It can feel like we're, you know, taking control of our health by taking a supplement, but we're being really stressed about other areas that we can't necessarily fix so it's easier to sort of ignore that but mm -hmm. I think it's a real problem that we need to acknowledge and um, try and work out ways that we can make that better mm -hmm. and I always think about it as everyone's stress will be different the things that you can do to deal with that will be different so it's about sort of furnishing your own toolbox with the right tools that work for you so you know for example meditation is spoken about as an important practice to mitigate stress but perhaps that also requires a person to have like lessons or to learn mm -hmm. you know and invest the time to practice and it's only going to be beneficial if they've done it for six months and you know the stressed out mum in the supermarket getting a call from her boss is not going to be able to stand there and meditate you know yeah. it's maybe there's a different tool for her maybe it's just about taking deep breaths and elong elongating the exhale and remembering that you can control your breathing, which can control your heart rate, which can give your body a sign that you feel calm and everything's gonna be okay. So it's just about finding your little tools and practices. And for some people that might be the gym or it might be, you know, just seeing a friend once a week, but having that, you know, at your disposal so you're kind of armed and ready because it's inevitable and it's not easy to, to manage. Yeah, on that note, my complete kind of stress coping mechanism with anything life throws at me is exercise mm, mm -hmm. and it's something I got into at medical school when I would have so much work to do I felt like I was drowning in it whereas exercise felt like a productive break yeah it was I mean it's kind of wrong isn't it but actually I would think oh if I go out for a run or I go yeah. and play netball or tennis or something um I'm doing something productive but it's also a rest yeah um and now that's kind of just stemmed into my adult life where yeah that is my coping mechanism it's like mm -hmm. my me time in the day does exercise have any effect on our immune system? Yes, most definitely. And this is something that um, has sort of been a big focus in terms of the sort of exercise immunology field, looking at athletes. But then there's lots of studies where it kind of filters down to what we can do as just sort of regular people. Um, and we know that we need to move our body. So anything cardio, walking, swimming, cycling, running, anything that's getting your heart rate up is really, really important because our immune cells are traveling around your body all the time. They're performing surveillance or looking out for something untoward. Um, and they require the lymphatic fluid to, to help them move around. And so your lymphatics are a bit like your circulatory system that carries your blood around, but they don't have the heart pumping the fluid. So they rely on your muscles moving. So you wanna get those lymphatic um, uh, uh, vessels going 
by moving as much as possible. And so it's thinking about, you know, if you're very active, you might go to the gym several times a week, but you might have a sedentary job that mm. involves sitting for eight hours a day. And this is a really common problem because a lot of work is at a computer. So you can be both sedentary and active and it's sort of tackling that sedentary part, which is really hard. Mm. So breaking up the, the sitting is going to be something that I would encourage everyone to do. And then getting that heart rate up and, and, and moving as much as possible. So that's one sort of really core piece. And there's lots of studies that will look at, you know, people who are recreational active so not going to that sort of athlete level but just moving regularly and they have lower incidences of you know common um, infections respiratory viruses that kind of thing the other aspect is to look at um what what we're doing for our long-term health so mm -hmm. your immune system is kind of important for your health span so how long you live and how healthy you feel and one of the ways that we can look at this is that your immune system ages over time as you know, we are aging, but your immune age is not the same as your chronological age. And there's a really wonderful study that was done in Birmingham University where they look at, took some sedentary 20 something and some very active um, 70 and 80 year olds. And they looked at their thymus gland, which is a gland in your neck, which is producing T cells, which are a really important immune cell. And they found that the older people who were taking care of their muscles, and keeping that muscle mass into old age, that's quite hard to do. You start to lose it quite rapidly as the decades go on if you're not using it. The muscles were producing particular compounds, we call them myokines, which were stimulating the thymus gland to keep it young. So oh. it was rejuvenating it. And so they actually had an immune age that was way younger than their actual age. And then the opposite was found in the sedentary 20 and 30 something. So it just goes to show that yes, we get old and getting old comes with things going wrong. Mm -hmm. But there are ways that we can keep our immune age younger, which means as we get older, we're going to be less vulnerable to certain things. And so taking care of the muscle mass, I think is something that I've got quite passionate about yeah. because it's, you know, it's really, really tricky. And a lot of elderly people might get uh, into hospital because they have a fall mm -hmm. and they might be immobilized while they're recovering and they'll quickly, quickly lose that muscle mass. And mm -hmm. as soon as that goes, it's really hard to regain it. But if we can sort of build that bank when we're younger, it can help for those later decades. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's two points on that. When we think about muscle wasting, we always think about super elderly people that yeah. are in hospital after a fall. Yeah. But actually women that are going through the menopause and have that big yes. drop in estrogen yeah, yeah. also see that reduction in muscle mass. And yeah. you know, that is not old women. That's like yeah, 50, exactly. around the age of 50 upwards. So um, actually that's something that yeah. we can benefit from. And the second point that I, I love about that point you made is that it's another benefit of exercise that yeah. you can't see oh I know yeah we all, yeah most of us got into exercise um for one reason or another and, uh, and for many people that's aesthetic benefits yeah, exactly um, or they want to lose weight or tone up or whatever their goal mm -hmm. but actually I love the saying that a bad workout doesn't exist yeah because if you just knew you know what you're doing for your long-term yeah, health and exactly. one of them being your immune system it's just a it's just a lovely thought isn't yeah, it yeah <laughs> exactly and I think that point on menopausal women is really important and I have lots of conversations like that with friends um and I feel like we all grew up in this era where you you exercise to burn calories like mm. that was the the 70s and 80s and it's like for a lot of people that's really been internalized and then when they get into their 40s and 50s it's literally cardio to burn and I, and I'm like you don't you need to look after your muscles yeah. <laughs> like this is going to be what's going to take you through those decades so it's really important that we change the narrative and exercise becomes about living long and healthy and saying oh when I'm 80 I want to still be able to do all these things yeah. and be active and engage in the activities I love because that gives me a good sense of well-being for many other reasons yeah. and so yeah it's we can start now and it might be the difference of you know getting the flu and being able to manage it in your yeah. own home compared to getting the flu and being hospitalized yeah. and being extremely unwell as an older adult with exactly. it exactly um no i love that um i'm gonna have a quick look at more questions <laughs> whether we should take any supplements. We can mm -hmm. always piece it together back with the diet bit. So we can't necessarily boost our immune system with a single fix, but mm -hmm. should we be taking any supplements? 
Yes, it's a really tricky question to answer. I kind Sorry. of think... <laughs> is what the listeners want to yeah, hear. Yeah, it's... Um, you could argue that if you're deficient in any of the essential vitamins or minerals, that that would impact your immune system. Um, if we think about the UK, I think about what, one in six people are deficient in vitamin D. That's going to be more likely through winter. Mm -hmm. It's going to, you know, the level you have in September will pretty much half by the time you get to February, March. And vitamin D is really important for your immune system, particularly for those winter viruses. So I would suggest that everyone is um, getting their vitamin D supplement ahead of winter and taking it consistently. It's not the sort of thing that you can say, oh, I missed it for five days, so I'll just take five days dose in one go. It's not going to work like that. Um, some people might be recommended to take it throughout the year, mm. particularly if they don't get out in the sun much or they you know, are not getting that exposure to sun in the summer. Um, so vitamin D is like the, the sort of key one, but you could argue that if you're deficient in any of the other vitamins or minerals, then that deficiency would leave you more vulnerable and supplements should be there to supplement an already good diet. So they're plugging holes, they're not in place of a good mm. diet. I often um, am guilty of this, that I just think, oh, if I've got a multivitamin in the cupboard, I'll just take it, yeah. there's no harm. But is that true? Is there harm to our immune system if we kind of overdose on supplements? Yeah, I think for certain nutrients, it's definitely possible. So particularly for the fat soluble vitamins, so A, D, E, and K, um, because they, they're not being removed as uh, easily, they can be stored in our fat tissue. Mm -hmm. I think most multivitamins on the shelf are probably have levels that are sort of low enough that you wouldn't ever get to those mm -hmm. um, uh, situations if you were taking it according to the, the um, recommended dose. And vitamin A is one to be a bit careful of. I think particularly pregnant women should um, uh, check with their healthcare provider yeah. and go for a, like a pregnancy supplement that's designed for, for women yeah. uh, in that situation. Um, what was the other thing? <laughs> I was just saying about whether we should be taking supplements, like whether a multivitamin yeah. is actually relevant. I mean, there's some of these trials that have looked at like ta whether taking a multivitamin is good for this or that. It sort of depends on what it, outcome they've looked at. Mm. Um, it's not really like a safety net. Like it's not going to make you invincible. I would always advocate for food first yeah. and then supplement where necessary. Um, and that will change across your lifespan. So, you know, things that you would need when you're a child might be different to when you're in midlife or if you're pregnant. Um, over 50s might, might, you know, be recommended to supplement with specific things. Yeah. So it's a really tricky one. I think just really going for a good balanced diet. Yeah is kind of, that's where your insurance policy yeah. should be. And then maybe specifically targeting things. So if you don't eat fish, for example, an omega-3 supplement is recommended. Mm -hmm. So there's certain situations. I remember watching your TEDx talk and you said that your immune system is a bit like a cake and actually maybe supplements are a bit like the sprinkles oh, when actually yeah. you should be focusing on <laughs> the main ingredients and the foundations of having a good cake base. And yeah. I think that's a great approach because people think, oh, should I pay this expensive supplement or this mm -hmm. expensive green powder but actually they're not cooking their meals from scratch they're probably not eating enough plants they're yeah, not moving they're stressed exactly and I can see where people get that you know mm. it almost feels like but I've just paid money for this thing that says it's gonna do this mm. so like you're putting the onus on that instead of going oh but I also need to kind of stop being stressed and just you know do a better grocery shop and sort out my meal plans and get you know out get moving and sleep more yeah exactly so emerging evidence that that has a massive impact yeah. not just on how groggy we feel but also yeah on... I'd forgotten about the cake analogy but <laughs> I think that's it's really kind of how I saw the layers coming together like you know sprinkles is not a cake but yeah. the base that's that's the cake and the other things are just like the icing's nice to have but a cake's still a cake without the icing. So like all the fancy supplements and all the fancy like wellness practices, like, you know, cold water swimming and sauna and I don't know, you name whatever, you know, latest Trend. biohack is coming out. They're, they're great. And there's probably some evidence that they're good for you, but it's the little things you're doing consistently. That's what's going to really build that foundation. I love that. And I hope this episode is kind of the recipe to the proper meaty cake yeah. rather than the sprinkles. So when I'm going to ask you a question, I know what the answer is going to be. Do these immunity boosting IV drips that you can pay hundreds of pounds for work? Do you know what? I I, I haven't seen any, any evidence to convince me. Um, and I... 
I've tried to keep an open mind. I always try and keep an open mind about many things. Um, and I met someone recently who who left medicine to go and run these clinics. And I was really surprised at that. But I think it is just a kind of novelty. Mm. I don't think there's any harm because they're probably giving a dose that's, you know, probably not going to be harmful but I don't think there's going to be a massive step function change mm. in in a benefit that you're going to feel and you probably come out 60 quid later <laughs> it's more than, that. more than that I think you saved our listeners quite a lot of money from saying that. <laughs> and um you mentioned at the beginning that you did a little bit of research in um allergies and asthma mm-hmm. what do you think about these um home allergy tests I think people are really kind of savvy now do I have an allergy um do I have an intolerance what's yeah. your kind of take on the home allergy testing do you mean uh so I think it's first to good to like uh, define allergy versus intolerance so an allergy is when you have a probably an immediate reaction to something so whether that's a, like an asthma attack or a food allergy you normally would um, experience some very sudden gastro symptoms or anaphylaxis which is sort of sort of whole body allergic response um intolerances sometimes people use the terms interchangeably allergies are classically driven by your immune system going wrong it's reacting against something that's not harmful um and an intolerance traditionally was not thought of as being something driven by your immune system, although that sort of area of research is starting to sort of change a little bit. Um, The food intolerance tests, I would say, definitely save your money uh, for a few reasons. So they're not validated, um, you know, the, the... the way that they're looking at intolerances is testing for an antibody called IgG. Uh, this is something that your immune system does produce, but it produces it to foods that you both tolerate and things that you may not tolerate. Mm. So it's it's very, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of foods that you'll be told you cannot eat. And we don't know actually whether most of these are actually foods you can tolerate. So they're just completely not valid, the ones that you can buy online and, and on, the high, on the high street. Um, the other thing is like I've spoken to people who've who've put themselves on a really restrictive diet by following these um, results uh, with no guidance, mm. no nutrition professional t- taking their hand and showing them how to to, you know, follow a diet, reintroduce foods and, and giving them a long term plan. And it can just really manifest in disordered eating. Mm. So I think that for that reason alone, like save your money. The interesting thing is that there are really recent studies trying to see if there is any evidence about food intolerances and this IgG antibody. There was one um, randomized placebo control clinical trial, which was a couple of years ago, it was quite recent, with people with irritable bowel syndrome. So um, not inflammatory bowel disease, but just that irritable bowel, which is normally considered a functional gut disorder. So if you were to put a camera down into the digestive tract, you wouldn't see any inflammation. It looks normal, it looks healthy, but the person is experiencing these really difficult digestive symptoms. So normally you think it's not the immune system because the immune system would cause inflammation and you'd be able to see that in the digestive tract. But they did find that some people with IBS do have um, this inflammation, but a very, very subtle amount. And there may be some correlation with these IgG antibodies, but it's such early stages in working this out. You know, this is just really early stage research. And so perhaps in several years, you'll be able to have that conversation with your GP. You can refer you to a clinic and they'll be able to do the appropriate um, exploring of this and then provide you with, you know, a dietitian who can support you on that. But definitely don't touch the, <laughs> the high street test. Save your money. Good to know. <laughs> so you are great at showcasing your um, immunology knowledge on social media. And if you don't follow Jenna, then definitely do. Mm-hmm. I learned so much. But what is one of the like most frustrating things you see as an expert on social media when it comes to immunity? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> I could be here all day. Um, yeah, I think just... Th- People not acting with compassion. I know that sounds really strange, but I feel like I'm, I have this insight into this area of immunology, but I'm also like just a human. I'm a mum. I have a job. You know, I'm also navigating how tricky it is to stay well in the modern world. And I, I just see these people giving this advice that's so black and white, yes, no, um, that, and then I speak to my friends and they're like, oh, I've just seen this on Instagram and I'm so confused. And I just think that, 
we always have to have an open mind and just be really careful about the person who might be receiving the information and that they maybe don't have that comprehensive knowledge of the human body that you do delivering that information and sort of really listen to that and yeah I just think be really kind kind that. and considerate I feel like we've got a theme here of being <laughs> kind to ourselves in this episode mm -hmm. what takeaway tips would you give to our listeners on ways that they can actually support or boost their immune system this this winter I would say if you get ill, it's not a moral failing. It's not because your immune system's terrible. There is an exposure element to it that we have to consider. Um, think about all the little things that you can do and how they add up. And really just, I would put your energy into those practices that are um, going to help you develop healthy habits. So we all automatically brush our teeth every day. If we didn't brush our teeth every day, it probably wouldn't turn out very well. At one point, you didn't know how to brush your teeth. And I do that with my kids. It took weeks and weeks and weeks of consistently putting loads of effort in before they established that habit. If you do that little bit of effort to get a habit, whether that's going to bed at the same time every day, adding in more plants, working on improving the fiber in your diet, working on, you know, getting out for a walk, you know, twice a week at lunchtime, something like that. If you put that little bit of effort in and just focus on one thing at a time, don't try and incorporate 10 new habits, then that's really what's going to take you through, um, you know, the years, the decades and into that really healthy old age that hopefully we all can achieve. I love that. <laughs> and our closing question on this podcast, I ask all my guests, mm -hmm. what is your vision of health? What does health look like to you? Do you know what, Dessa, I love that question. I love thinking like, well, it's very unique and it's very different for everyone, but it's, it's having resilience against the things life threw at us. So, you know, we might get sick from when our kids bring home a cold from, from their school but you've got the resilience to deal with that and be able to, you know, recover well because you have all those healthy habits in place. And I think that same with stress, you know, you've got the tools in your toolbox to be resilient. So there will be massive ups and downs and it could be from week to week, month to month or year to year, but you've got that resilience to, to deal with it. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to me today. I know I have learned so much from this conversation <laughs> um, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. Where can people find you if they want to learn more? Thank you for having me. It's been amazing. Uh, they can find me mostly on Instagram. I have tried on other social media, but <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to find the time. Um, so find me on Instagram and then my two books you can get in all good bookshops. Um, I also have a website where I do post blogs maybe every couple of weeks um most recently about menopause and the immune system so that's quite topical for um for people uh yeah amazing well <laughs> i've learned so much from you thank you again no problem <laughs> thank you so much for listening to vision of health i hope you take away some realistic and practical health advice that you can actually incorporate in your busy lives to become the healthiest version of yourself if you want to hear more from me then please do hit the subscribe button share this post and also go follow me on instagram at dr frankie js where i post a regular series of women's health wednesdays with our wonderful sponsors femfresh i'll see you next time I'm Dr. Frankie, and this is my vision of health.